Hi, this is Pete Lyons with Let's Play Salesforce, and in tonight's Einstein Analytics video, we're going to be talking about time zone offsets for the user. Along the way, we're going to learn some useful stuff about how to adjust for daylight savings time, as well as how to offset for leap years. So a lot of different things we're actually going to be covering in this, all about this phenomena called date math. So first, let's set the stage by understanding the current limitations and why we need to do this at all. Uh, so Einstein Analytics currently only sees in GMT. And that might not seem like a big deal, but if you're in Sydney, Australia, for example, that could be an entire uh, business day's worth of opportunities being attributed into the wrong quarter of business. Uh, and this is also going to cause uh, some anomalies when reporting in standard Salesforce versus Einstein Analytics. Uh, in most cases, when we're aggregating as a whole, this difference is going to be subtle or negligible, especially the closer we are to GMT. But, uh, you know, the further we start to move away from that and when we have like kind of a global enterprise wide rollout, then, uh, you know, we do start to run into these sort of considerations. There is a completely different method to doing this on a dashboard by dashboard basis if you wanted to use a SQL step to return the user's current uh, time zone offset and then augment your dates uh, in SQL that way. Uh, but that's a completely different approach. Uh, it is better suited for one-offs. Uh, this is kind of a broader sweeping data flow uh, approach. If you do want to see a video about how to do this on a dashboard level, please let me know in the comments and I might consider it for a future release. Uh, so now let's dive into the compute expression that uh, we're doing this with. And uh, what we've got here is a bunch of different fields. And why did I take this approach? Because I wanted the final calculations for what we're actually doing here to make more sense instead of just having this giant math formula. I wanted to kind of walk through how we build up to that. That said, you could take all of the different components of these formulas, mash them together into one big thing. It would probably run a little bit more efficiently in the data flow because it's not multiple fields. Uh, and if you choose to just clone all the fields that I'm showing you here, uh, then you would probably want to slice those off before registering your final data set. Uh, one real strong limitation to this approach is that it must be done for each field, uh, for each date field in your data set, and it must be done uh, differently for each user's time zone. It's not smart enough to figure out where people are and offset accordingly. It's one and done for the entire data set. So if you have users in multiple time zones, you're going to want to create different variant data sets and then have different versions of your dashboard. It's not a super scalable solution. But if you do actually uh, have that absolute use case where you just get that one killer data set where, you know, if we could just offset create a date, you know, to be in the right time zone and it's, you know, all your business users are in one spot, then maybe this is a good approach for you. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the subsequent fields that we've created. Uh, we're also looking at a distinction between historical and current. The reason why is because we don't need to actually shift all of the uh, created dates based on when those records happened. Uh, it's really all about now um, because they're all fixed by GMT. That's kind of our zero marker. And it's really about how we're perceiving them today and where we are. That's what we're offsetting based on. So if you don't need anything like uh, compensation for daylight savings time, I recommend just adding uh, you know, the number of seconds to push to your time zone and just call it a day. Uh, but if you do want to have sensitivity to daylight savings time, uh, we do take a slightly longer trip. And the reason that I've created these uh, historical variations of the fields is so that we can uh, kind of have a, a little bit of a litmus test and not just say, oh, Pete got it right for this year. Uh, this is more to answer the question of if we were at the moment that that record was created, what offset would we be seeing? Uh, so the first field that I want to show is going to be this March 7th field. Uh, so what we need to do to figure out daylight savings time is we need to find the second Sunday in March, first off, because this is going to tell us when daylight savings time began. Uh, so what I'm doing is actually trying to figure out what day in the year that it is right now and roll back to the beginning of the year. Uh, this is actually going to return uh, December 31st of the previous year. And then I want to add 66 days to that. Now we're also seeing this number 86400. We're going to be seeing it a lot. Uh, what this number represents is the number of seconds in a day. And so when we're trying to get from a value that counts in seconds to a value that counts in days, we're going to multiply or divide by this number as needed. 
Uh, so right here uh, we see you know 66 times 86400. We're saying just give me the number of seconds in 66 days. So if I take December 31st in any given year and I add 66 days to that, it's going to bring me up to March 7th. And then depending on you know I know that at least one Sunday has already passed. So then I just need to figure out the number of days until the following Sunday, and that's going to be when my uh, daylight savings time started. So then if we look at that historical March 7th field, it's doing the exact same thing, but instead it's using the uh, created date of the record so that we can kind of imagine how it would be if we were back in that year. Otherwise, these formulas are identical. Uh, so next, I need to actually calculate my leap year offset. And uh, the reason for this is because if I add 66 days to January or to uh, December 31st in a leap year, that's going to give me March 6th instead of March 7th. So what I do is first I take just the year of the uh, I take the year of my date. Um, in this case, I'm using now again, and I just try to figure out what year it is, and I divide that by four. Uh, if it is completely divisible by four and there's no remainder, then great, this is a leap year. Uh, otherwise, it's not a leap year. Uh, and this is not all 100% true if, the if it is a centennial year and that centennial is not divisible by 400, it is not a leap year. And the reason why is because if we just add a day every four years, we're actually compensating a little bit too much. So periodically, we have to skip that part, and that's once every 100 years. But even if we do that, then we're still compensating a little too far in the other direction, so every four centennials, we still do it anyway. What does this mean? It means that uh, 1700, 1800, and 1900 were not leap years, even though they were divisible by four, but the year 2000 was. So when does this uh, actually cause an issue? Well, for one day of the year, in the year 2100, uh, there is going to be one day where you're going to think that you're in daylight savings time and you're not, and one day of the year where you think that you're not in daylight savings time and you are. So I'm okay with this. I'm going to call it uh, the Y2.1K bug, and if you're still using this formula field uh, in another 82 years, then uh, embrace the madness. Uh, good for you. Uh, jolly good show. But what I'm I'm doing in this is I want to return a one if it's a leap year, so I know to add one extra day, and I want to return a zero in non leap years, so that I'm not adding an extra day. And the way that I do that is first I divide it by four, and that's going to give me the number of years divided by four with a uh, point, point zero or a point two five or a point five zero or a point seven five depending on whether I'm a leap year or the year after, da, 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 da. But I want a one on that zero, not a zero. So what I do is, uh, first I gotta do a little subtraction and I gotta get rid of you know whatever this was because 2000 has a whole lot more on the left of our decimal. So I'd use truncation and subtraction to just return everything after the decimal point. And then when I subtract one from that, uh, I'm only gonna get a one when what I'm subtracting is a zero and I'll get a zero any other time by using ceiling to round that number up to a one. So in other words, on my leap year, I return a zero. In all other years, I return a one, and then I subtract that from one, meaning that I return one in a leap year and zero in all other years. If that's a little too much to swallow, you've had plenty of time by now to copy the formula. So now that we have our leap year offset, uh, we need just a little bit more. And what we need is to be able to calculate the additional number of days after March 7th until we have our uh, next Sunday. So I'm doing this in the start DST field. And so I've got my March 7th epic, and then I'm adding on to that my leap year offset to guarantee that in a leap year, this March 7th epic is going to return a Sunday, or uh, is going to return uh, March 6th. So we add our leap year offset. And then I say, give me an eight minus the day of the week that uh, that March 7th is actually happening on. So this means that uh, I'm going to return a 1 through 7 depending on what day of the week it is, and that's going to tell me how many days I need to add to get to the following Sunday. And this is kind of a do what you do on the left and do what you do on the right sort of bit right here. Um, I also have to add the uh, leap year offset over here 
because I'm referencing that same March 7th epic in the uh, calculation to figure out what day of the week it is. And if I don't also include the leap year offset, then I'm accidentally gonna add two days in a leap year instead of one. And again, we see multiple instances of 86400 here, and this is just so that we can keep switching back and forth between using epic seconds and epic days. Uh, so now that I put it all together, I've got my created date EST. And we're not just taking uh, that you know start date for DST value. Uh, we actually have to go a little bit further than that. So right here we see start date EST plus 7200 because uh, the reason why is daylight savings time does not start at midnight. It actually starts at 2 a.m. on the second Sunday of March. So we do need to add uh, 7200 seconds to move that forward. So I say, well, if we're greater, if our uh, you know current time is greater than the beginning of DST this year, and we're less than the end of DST this year, so I take the start of DST and I add this to it. What is this? This is 238 times 86400. So it's the number of seconds in 238 days, which is the exact amount of time between the uh, second Sunday in March and the second Sunday in November. Um, that's uh, that's why we need to add this amount. So now we say when uh, when now is between the beginning of DST, which is our start DST epic plus 7200 seconds, and less than the end of DST, which is our start DST uh, plus the two hours, plus uh, 238 days worth of seconds, well, then we're inside DST. And I wanna take my created date epic and I wanna subtract five hours from it, which is gonna be 18,000 seconds. Otherwise, I'm not in DST and I wanna subtract 14.4 uh, thousand seconds. Now, this number might look a little bit familiar. It's actually 10 times the number of uh, minutes in a day, which is because it's uh, you know 60 times uh, four hours, and there we go. It's actually because we're dealing with base 12 math here, so that's why we're always seeing a lot of uh, you know one, four, four combinations. That's 12 times 12. Uh, this is comparable to how you'll see numbers like uh, 1024 when dealing with binary a lot. Uh, this is also where we get our 7200s and our 86400s. Uh, so we do actually want to cast this one out as uh, a date time field so that we can see how it actually looks. So let's actually go into the analytics studio now and see how this worked out for us. So again, we've got these historical calculations to tell us what it would have been if we were if we were back then, you know, checking it out back then, even though we would never actually want to use these on a dashboard level. They're really just for validating our results. So the first column that we have right here is the historical March 7th value. And again, it does not take into consideration that 2016 was a leap year. We're just adding 66 days to uh, the previous New Year's Eve. Uh, so then from there, we add in our leap year sensitive roll me forward to the next Sunday. And then here we have our start DST field, which is what it currently is, which is also the return for uh, the current year 2018 you know we're just seeing it on all the rows uh and then lastly here's where we have our uh, historical leap year offset notice that it correctly identified that 2016 was a leap year and added one uh well for the rest of the years we are not adding anything in so lastly this takes us to our uh created date and est field Notice how it's pretty much always the created date, but like four hours earlier. Since these were all, uh, you know, created exactly at midnight, we're always just, you know, four hours before that or at 20 hundred hours. And if we go all the way down to the bottom, we got a couple of ra uh, random stray opportunities that I've created while doing various experimentation in this org. And we do see that those are still offset by the correct number of hours because we have currently just ended daylight savings time, and as a result, our offset from GMT right now is only four hours. Uh, so, if you liked this video, um, you know, please hit the button, uh, subscribe, tell a friend, and as always, thanks for.